Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Jennifer. Good job leading us. Good job. So it's uh, probably not a surprise by now that we're talking about forgiveness. Do you find forgiveness to be one of the hardest subjects in the Christian's life? I hear some murmuring, so I think that was a yes. Amen, somebody said. Yet to Jesus, it seems sort of automatic. Jesus seems sort of insistent about it. That's very irritating. But he does. That's how he seems to be. Do you find that a challenge? The disciples did. One day he was talking to the disciples, and he said to them, if there's repentance, you must forgive. And if that same person sins against you seven times, and they come back seven times and repent and say, I'm sorry, you have to forgive them. And you know what the disciples said? Increase our faith. We can't do that. They didn't say that we can't do that part, but you get the picture. That's what they were really saying. And the, the um, Lord was still relentless because he said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, that's small, then you can say to this mulberry tree, move over there to that sea, and it will move to that sea, and it would obey you. So there's this strange coupling that Jesus has of forgiveness with faith with answered prayer. And powerful answered prayer. So let's listen to today's passage. It's in Mark. Mark chapter 11. In the morning as they went along, they, meaning Jesus and the disciples, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Now, were you following along great until he got to that last sentence? Oh, forgive, he says, so your sins will be forgiven. And so it's coupled with prayer. And so since we're talking about forgiveness, prayer, we have to talk about forgiveness today. So we're going to see if we can figure out that connection. Why are they connected? Um, in doing so, we're going to identify forgiveness in broad general terms. We're not going to look at it in specific personal terms. Just we're going to look at the big picture about forgiveness. It's going to be kind of talking about an attitude of forgiveness. Let it permeate everything. And so we're going to explore that attitude of forgiveness. So let's look at the definition in Webster. And Webster says, forgiveness is to grant pardon for or absolve an offense. It is to give up all claim to a debt or an obligation. Forgiveness is to grant pardon to a person. It's to cease to feel resentment about. Now he's getting personal. It is to cancel an indebtedness. So that's the definition. Now sometimes it helps me to look at the antonym to understand the definition. So its antonym is to maintain hostility. So let's look at one more definition. Retribution. Webster defines it as requital according to merits of deserts, especially for evil. Now that's kind of a mouthful. What it means, the Bible explains it as an eye for an eye, retribution, an eye for an eye. You do this evil to me, I get to do that evil back. And so its antonym is forgiveness, pardon, and sympathy. Sympathy. 
Now, isn't that interesting? Sympathy. So forgiveness is to grant pardon, to cease from feeling resentment, to let go of retribution, and assume sympathy for. Now, before you slam the subject shut and run out that door, I'm going to have Elder Jocelyn go lock it. That's not written in here. It's <laughs> just came to my mind. That's bad. Something had, something had to drive Jesus to forgive us, right? Something had to drive him to forgive us. Why, why would Jesus or God have care? Well, because they're just kind of sympathetic. They are sympathetic. They have compassion for us. Once when Jesus was out on a hill with a lot of people and he had been healing all day and he must have been tired, but he saw these people and he said they're like sheep without a shepherd. That's compassion. And then in Isaiah, it says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the mother sheep. That's sympathy. That's compassion. And God was talking to people who had turned away from him, to idols. That's amazing. Now let's think of our story of Joseph. He had been the recipient of undeserved hostility. Do you know that story about Joseph? He had been abandoned by his brothers. I think many people do know that story. It's one of the most famous stories in the Bible because he's abandoned by his brothers. Then he gets bought by Potiphar. And he, then he gets accused by Potiphar's wife. Then Potiphar believes his lying wife and puts him in jail. And then he stays there for about 15 years. And then the cupbearer, he helps out and kind of saves his life and gives him hope. And he says tell Pharaoh about me and the cupbearer forgot so that's Joseph's sad story it was a long long time and so yet when he sees his brothers he has sympathy for them it's amazing that's an attitude of forgiveness that he has assumed. It's built on a lifestyle of forgiveness, probably out of necessity. But at first, Joseph was very harsh with his brothers. At first, he expressed a lot of bitterness. He imprisoned them. Take that. He wept over the memory of their abuse of him. He planted his silver cup in one of their sacks, and then he accused them of stealing it. When he was revealing himself, he cried so loud that the whole palace heard him. But then in that process, Joseph came to realize that their evil, despite all the pain that they had caused, that evil, God had turned it. God had used it for good. God had turned it around, first in his own life and then in theirs. And so he began to realize that. So when we look at Scripture, Scripture doesn't lie. It doesn't say that this is easy. It doesn't say forgiveness is easy. It doesn't say there's no hurt. It tells us about hurt. Think of Jesus' agony in Gethsemane when he's there, and he doesn't want to forgive. He's weeping in the garden. I don't want to do this, God. And he faces how hard that was. And he said, if there's any way, God, take it away from me. And then he did something interesting. He, he laid it in God's hands. But not my will, yours. And he just, he laid it in God's hands. Do you have someone to forgive? Can you think about that possibility? It might be like moving a mountain to you to do that. It might be too hard a step of faith right now because that is a step of faith to actually lay that person. But let's just consider the possibility for a minute. Consider exchanging a feeling of resentment for a choice, a choice of letting go. So you can cling to the feeling of resentment or you can 
choose to let it go. Now we're talking about an attitude of forgiveness, not a specific situation. We're talking about a lifestyle of forgiveness. The Civil War was a violent, volatile time. Loyalty to the home state prevailed. For example, for some it was their state against the federal government. And I use this example because of the kind of division that's going on that we are experiencing. But attitudes at that time were emotional. Attitudes were just explosive, and you protected your land and your property, and that was it. All in all. So I want to tell you the story of a young man, a young man named Richard Kirkland. He was from Kershaw County, South Carolina. I have no idea where that is, but it's probably underwater right at the moment. And so he enlisted in the Army when he was 17. It was a first call, and he stepped up and he volunteered, and three days later, he's in a war. Can you imagine that? I bet we got some 17-year-olds in here and you can't imagine. And so he fought in all the major battles in Virginia over the next year. And by the time he turned 19, many of his companions were either dead or wounded. And so what he did, because he was deeply religious, is he wrote all of the parents of all the people that he knew about that had died or that were injured to tell them the circumstances and to comfort them in their sorrow. And that's just something that he did as a young man. Of course, it would have been great if he didn't have to do this at all. It would have been great if all those people could have just come together, sat down, had a discussion about their differences, and, and kind of worked out a solution, right? However, given the circumstances and the continued battles, he was there. He was a part of that army, and so he distinguished himself with his courage and his compassion toward those who were injured and his letters to the families. So he was involved in an attack in Virginia at a place called Mary's Heights. The opposition was positioned at the bottom of the hill, Think of this long, huge, sloping hill, and then there's a wall right across about two-thirds of the way up. It is not a high wall. It is walls like you see in New England everywhere, low stone wall. And so his side was behind the stone wall. And so as the opposition charged, they met a barrage of rifle fire, and all these people started being hit and wounded or killed and they're dropping but they're also on the other side the same thing casualties were huge on both sides it's one of the biggest worst battles of the civil war and it continued and several thousand men were jammed behind that stone wall and they battled firing in shifts just firing out on those that were down the hill that had the worst position and yet to stand up was to expose yourself. So they were dropping too, and they battled all day long with terrific casualties on both sides. Finally, the fighting stopped. Both armies exhausted. The ones on the bottom of the hill could not rescue their wounded men that were lying all over the place. Thousands were dead and wounded, lying in agony in the slope, on the slope of Mary's Heights. All unhurt soldiers had to lay low because the minute they stood up, they were fired on. The ones on the one side using dead bodies for protection, the other ones trying to stay below that wall. And they all stayed alert in the cold darkness. And the injured soldiers on that slope were helpless. Nobody could rescue them. They were in terrible pain, and they were unable to get back to their lines. And so their fellow soldiers could not come forward and get them. So all night long, there was this cry, cry for help, crying out, just wails of crying all night long. 
agonizing cries for water, for warmth. And Richard Kirkland heard these cries all night long. Even though this was the enemy, even though this was the other side, the hated ones, these brave men were his brothers. They were Americans. And so that's rolling around in his head, and he's listening to the crying until early morning. And um, he has a heavy heart, and finally he could stand it no longer. He's thinking what to do. He had to do something. And so he sought out the captain of his company, and he came up with a plan, and he made this daring, unbelievable request. And his company leader said, I can't let you do that. I can't grant you permission, but I'm not going to tell you you can't do it. I'm going to send you to the commander. And so he sent him on to the commander. And the commander said the same thing. I'm sorry, I cannot let you carry out your plan, so I'm going to send you on to the colonel with this outrageous request. And there he is right there with General Kershaw. And he's giving his request. And throughout this process of going through these four different steps of leaders, he still didn't change his mind. He wasn't going to change. He wanted to gather all of the canteens that he could and fill them with water and go out on that battlefield and take a canteen and give water to each of those men that was crying out for water. And um, it would be so risky, he probably wouldn't last a minute. And that's why all these leaders couldn't give him permission because they were just giving him permission to die basically. And they, there was no reason why someone would allow his soldier to attempt that kind of mission in the heat of battle. And so Richard said, well, can I raise a white flag? And he said, no, this is not a truce. You cannot raise a flag. But the general, seeing how determined he was, granted permission. And so he strapped dozens of canteens on, arms. His arms are just loaded with canteens, canteens around his neck. And he um, crawled over the wall to a well, and he filled all of those canteens at that well, and then he stepped out on the battlefield. And the minute he stepped out, rifle fire exploded. But he ignored it. He knew where he was going. And so with all the courage he could muster, he stepped up and he went on to this first wounded soldier. And he knelt down beside the guy and he lifted his head, and he took a canteen and gave him water and quenched his thirst. And then he took a knapsack, the guy's knapsack. He rolled it up. He put it under his head. And then he took a coat that he found on the ground, and he covered the guy with his overcoat. And then King, that guy's empty canteen he moved on to the next and when he did that the bullets stopped and everybody on both sides was watching him in amazement they put down their rifles as he went from one fallen man to the next with sympathy with compassion like an angel from heaven the angel of Mary's Heights went to these men ministering to them 19 years old and he relieved the thirst of wounded enemy soldiers well when all his first canteens ran out he had picked up all the empty canteens he crawled back to the well and started filling up all of those canteens shots began to ring out Boy, we're stubborn, aren't we? Shots rang out from both sides, but then when he returned with those canteens, they fell silent. And he went on until he took canteens, took water, ministered, helped every wounded soldier that was within his area. And it took him two hours, and he did not quit until everyone was taken care of. Forgiveness is really hard, especially when you've been injured. You may not feel willing 
but an attitude of forgiveness in your life. It's an action of sympathy toward others when you encounter an enemy. It's an action that can do more to overcome hatred and division that you see around you than any other attitude, relieving and freeing you first, freeing from the bondage in the process. So Jesus offers you this gift. Will you take it? It's a chance to be free. At the same time, when you pray with that attitude in your heart, he says your prayers are going to be answered. Well, maybe the prayer, that's the mountain you need to move first. But it can be moved because the power of God gives it. Are you willing to trust him? Amen.